Last time we considered the first part of Matthew 1, and now we'll be looking at the verses 18 to 25. And those verses will also be the te- text for the sermon this morning. Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the previous Sunday we read the first part of Matthew 1. We might have expected that Matthew would start off his gospel account with something more exciting than a list of names. Yet we discovered that this beginning to the gospel had a very deliberate purpose and contained much more than we first thought. It is a most effective way to reach the Jews for whom Matthew wrote in the first place. And it tells them very clearly that Jesus Christ is the son of Abraham, the son of David, the one who has come to fulfill the promises which God has given to his people Israel. He is the one who has come to put a definitive end to the exile that has lasted for so long, and to make things right again between them and their covenant Lord. It probably struck you that during the reading of the long list of names, which are all different, there was one significant word which remained the same, the word father. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and so on. The word father is constantly repeated and becomes the refrain in the long list of names. Action is required on the father's part in order that a child might be conceived. That is a basic fact of human life, and that is the way it has gone for generations and will continue till the end comes. But when we come to verse 16, at the very end of the genealogy, we see something very remarkable. Notice that it does not say that Joseph is the father of Jesus. No, instead, there is a rather complicated formulation which is not used for any of the other previous persons. We read in verse 16, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Did Matthew just want to vary his formulation, finally, when he got to the last name? Or is there more to this? There is certainly a lot more to this change. For it shows that the birth of Jesus, who is called Christ, came about in a fundamentally different way than all the other births of all the other children in this list and in all of human history. The birth of Jesus Christ and the role of Joseph is very different from all the other births and roles of all the other fathers. Let us consider the nature of the birth of Jesus 
and the role of Joseph, son of Jacob, son of David. On this Christmas morning, I proclaim to you God's word under the following theme. The Lord gives Joseph the task of being the legal earthly father of Jesus Christ. We will see first the faith required for this task and second the blessings of this task. The rest of Matthew 1, the part that we read from verse 18 to the end of the chapter, is really an explanation of verse 16. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Those who would have been puzzled by the odd formulation of Joseph's connection to Jesus are now given an explanation. It is an explanation which had never been heard before in all of redemptive history. It is an explanation which could be given by God alone because it is a miracle that we could never have imagined. In our text, the place of Joseph in it all is highlighted rather than Mary, the mother of Jesus. Again, we see a difference with the Gospel of Luke which deals with Mary and her situation and says very little about Joseph. Matthew is more concerned with Joseph because of the attention he pays to the genealogy and the role of the father in that genealogy. And also because of what Joseph will mean for Jesus and the legal consequences of Joseph being his father by law. We read in verse 18 that Mary and Joseph were betrothed. They were engaged. Now an engagement or betrothal in ancient times had a different character than it does today. In our culture, it is possible to break an engagement. It is unusual but not unlawful. It can happen that things can come to light after engagement, which makes it clear that a man and a woman should not get married. But in the days of Mary and Joseph, the engagement was legally binding. And therefore, Joseph is even referred to as Mary's husband in verse 19, even though they are not actually married yet. It is the engagement or pledging to be married which was the critical part. The only thing that had not yet taken place was living together and consummating the marriage. But for all other intents and purposes, Mary and Joseph were inseparably united to one another. What a wonderful time that must have been for them, as it is for all young couples who are engaged and looking forward to their wedding day, a time of great anticipation and planning and getting ready for their future lives together. But then this dream of a wonderful future like all other young couples in joy, was shattered to the core. We read that before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. While they were considered husband and wife, while Mary was Joseph's wife, but before they consummated their marriage, Mary was found to be with child. A child is already growing in Mary's womb, but Joseph was not the cause of that child. Now sometimes it is supposed that Joseph suspected Mary of being unfaithful to him, that the child that was being expected was the result of another man, that therefore Joseph wanted to put an end to the marriage by seeking a divorce from Mary. Yet that is not what the text actually says, and it is better not to jump to those kinds of conclusions. It is certainly true that for many who observed what was happening, that many of them would have suspected that some unlawful activity was going on, perhaps between Mary and Joseph, that they could not wait with consummating until they actually were formally married and lived together. For both Joseph and Mary, it would have been a very difficult time to have to live with those kinds of suspicions and gossip. But it is important to understand that the phrase from the Holy Spirit in verse 18 
is not something that was only known to Mary. No, it seems most likely that Joseph knew that Mary was with child because of the work of the Holy Spirit, that she would have told him that. Now, this was not easy for him to believe. It was shocking and most incredible. It required faith for Joseph to believe this, and it is never easy to live by faith. He needed to believe the words of Mary to him. We know from the gospel according to Luke that Mary was told about the child she would be expecting by the angel Gabriel. She would be expecting a child because of the working of the Holy Spirit and this child would be a holy child, the Son of God. Mary had objected to the angel that she was a virgin. So how could she become pregnant? It would be a miracle from the Lord through the power of his spirit. Mary shared this wonderful news with her relative Elizabeth, a woman who had been barren for her whole life, but now was also found to be with child, expecting John the Baptist, who would fulfill a special role in the life of her child. Mary stayed at the house of Elizabeth for about three months. Elizabeth knew and understood that her Lord was going to be carried in Mary's womb. She sang about this reality to Mary when she arrived at her place. There were a few in Israel at that time who understood by faith that the Lord was working great things in Israel that the Redeemer and Messiah was about to arrive. The salvation that they had been longing for for so long was now about to happen. But now Joseph finds himself in a difficult situation. How can he consummate the marriage with Mary, his wife, and be married to her in a complete way when the Holy Spirit has caused her to conceive a child? Would he not be intruding on holy ground, as it were? He does not want to interfere in any way with Mary's task of bearing the holy child, the Son of God. We read that Joseph was a just, a righteous man. He was someone who feared the Lord and wanted to do what was right in God's eyes. And now, in this situation... Joseph wanted to make sure that Mary was not hurt in any way by his actions, that she would not be disgraced in public before all people. Joseph does not want to accuse Mary, someone who has been unfaithful, someone who therefore deserved the death penalty because he knew that she was not guilty of unfaithfulness. The Lord was very clear about what should happen in the situation of infidelity. Both the man and the woman should die. Joseph's righteousness comes out in the action that he takes. Joseph does not want to disgrace Mary because he knows that Mary has done nothing to deserve being disgraced. Joseph wants to do anything he can to protect the name of Mary in this situation. And so Joseph does the only thing that he sees as a solution to this problem. He decides to divorce Mary quietly. It is he, Joseph, who must disappear from the scene. He does not disgrace Mary, but rather plans to effect a divorce with the minimum of fuss through writing a certificate of divorce according to the provision of God's law. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, there we read, And when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house. Nothing displeasing had happened as such, But Joseph felt that there was interference in their marriage. Mary is with child, but not through Joseph. 
And so Joseph, the righteous man, feels that he needs to back out and disappear. He was not needed for this child, and therefore he should not be married to Mary any longer. The engagement and the marriage should be annulled. He thinks of how to do this in the way that would create the least fuss. Let this be over with so that Mary can do her task without obligations to Joseph. As Joseph was seriously considering this plan of action, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. Joseph must not divorce Mary. That is not necessary. That must not happen, for the child to be born also needs to have a father, a father according to the law. The importance of the role of Joseph is stressed by the angel in how the angel addresses Joseph. He calls Joseph the son of David. Joseph is the royal heir whose legal son Jesus will establish the throne of David forever and ever. He will restore the former glory and cause it to be much greater than ever before. For he will establish a spiritual kingdom that will never fade away or be overcome by sin and the forces of darkness. The angel tells Mary not to fear, to take Mary as his wife. The clause that begins with for, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, should not be understood as the angel telling Joseph something he did not know and is now hearing for the first time. No, rather the angel is telling Joseph that he understands why Joseph does not feel that he can take Mary as his wife. But that reason for caution and backing out on Joseph's part is not necessary. Joseph can still take Mary as his wife, and indeed he must do that. For the child to be born needs to have an earthly and legal father. Joseph has a task as well to fulfill towards the child to be born. The angel explains to Joseph that his task is to give the child a name, and that name will be Jesus. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. As the angel explains it, for he will save his people from their sins. What a revelation Joseph receives from the angel. Joseph responds to the words of the angel in faith and obedience. When he wakes up from his dream, he took Mary as his wife, but he did not have union with her until Jesus was born. The angel did not expressly forbid such union, but out of respect for God's work, he does not consummate the marriage until after Jesus is born. Joseph acts in faith and obedience by taking the words of the angel to heart and by responding to the message of the gospel which he heard from the angel. We read in verse 22 that all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This prophecy was spoken during the days of King Ahaz, king of Judah. When he heard this word, this sign of the child Emmanuel, then Ahaz refused to acknowledge the sign and said in false piety that he did not want to put the Lord to the test. But Joseph does not act in like manner. He does not go against the angel's direction by still refusing to marry his wife out of excessive piety, thinking that he should not be married to someone who is bearing the Son of God, and by refusing the task of being the legal father to Jesus. No, he fulfills 
his God-given task and completes it to his glory. It was necessary for Jesus to have a human father who would give him his name, present him for circumcision, and link Jesus to the house of David. For the Gospel of Matthew testifies that Jesus was the son of David through Joseph, who is of the line of David. When we consider the miracle of what happened in the conception of Jesus, then we cannot underestimate the role of faith in the life of Joseph and also Mary. This was something that was, of course, completely unheard of before. That the child should be born who has no natural human father. Could it really be true? Joseph must have had nagging doubts now and then about the true nature of the child, and yet he was able to go forward in faith. May that be of encouragement also to us, brothers and sisters. For in a certain sense, the situation that we face is not really much different from that of Joseph's. When unbelievers hear that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, there can be much eye-rolling and mockery. Do you really believe that? Surely that can't be true, they say. Are we willing to stand firm in the faith and to believe the miracle of the virgin birth, the miracle of the conception of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. It is vital for our salvation. It is impossible for us to be saved if Jesus Christ was born of a natural father, for then he would be nothing special but just another sinful human being like we all are. And then we would be without hope and without any forgiveness of sins. Hold fast to the faith, brothers and sisters, and never think too little of our Heavenly Father, who can do all things, and who will fulfill His word and remain faithful to His promises. Yet also on this point of the virginity of Mary, we also do not need to go overboard either as the Roman Catholic Church has done in declaring Mary to be an ever-virgin. In the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, we can read the following. The deepening of faith in the virginal motherhood led the Church to confess Mary's real and perpetual virginity, even in the act of giving birth to the Son of God made man. In fact, Christ's birth did not diminish his mother's virginal integrity, but sanctified it. And so the liturgy of the church celebrates Mary as the ever-virgin. End of quote. Our salvation does not depend upon Mary remaining a virgin. After the birth of Jesus, we know that Joseph and Mary received children, brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus. Joseph and Mary were able to live a normal life as husband and wife after Jesus' birth and receive more children. Mary has a special place in the history of redemption as the flesh and blood mother of our Lord. But after the birth of Christ, her special task was over and she joined the multitude of the faithful together with her husband Joseph the legal earthly father of Jesus Christ. Now we come to the second point, the blessings of the task Joseph had as father. The most important task that Joseph had, is give, what he was given to do, is that of giving the name to the child Mary bore. The name Jesus, or Joshua, was most unusual for the line of David, and is not found in the long list of names earlier in the chapter. The name Jesus was specially chosen by God and communicated to Joseph by the angel. Joseph was instructed to give the child that particular name 
for it showed to everyone his significance in God's plan for the world. He is the one who would take away the sins of the world. He is the one who would save God's people from their sins. The Lord Jesus was able to fulfill the law of God in its fullness, in part because he had a legal father who caused him to have legal standing in the community of God's people. He was the heir of Joseph, son of David. He was subject to the law of God as an Israelite in every respect. It is not as though he was a special divine child who therefore had no connection or grounding in the law of Israel. He was not above the law, but under the law. It is also important to remember that he officially received the name Jesus at his circumcision. We can read that in Luke 2, verse 21. And how appropriate that name also is at the occasion of his circumcision. For it was by the shedding of his blood that he would save his people from their sins. Already as an infant, he was shedding his blood for the salvation of many. The blood of all other male infants was shed at their circumcision as a sign of God's grace and goodness. But the blood of Jesus Christ was shed in order that he might provide the payment that was necessary. Jesus Christ would fulfill what the law and the prophets said about him. Jesus Christ was born under the law. He was born to fulfill the law in our place. We showed ourselves to be unable to do that. What we were unable to do, Jesus Christ came to do. The Lord God truly does save his people through Jesus Christ. God's Son came from heaven to save us from all of our sins. He came and underwent much humiliation and suffering in order that we might be accepted before God and be made righteous in his sight. In our time, we no longer have circumcision as the sign of God's covenant with us, but rather the sign of baptism. When we are baptized, then we receive the promises of God, as these promises have also been realized in the work of Jesus Christ. Because of his shed blood, also the blood that was shed at his circumcision, our sins may be washed away, and we may be cleansed and made clean before God. Because of the work of the child who was born of the Virgin Mary, we may have peace and communion with God unending and know ourselves to belong to our faithful Heavenly Father always in all circumstances. How great are the blessings which come to us through Jesus Christ. His birth is the greatest miracle of all, for in his birth, God himself came to dwell among us. He is truly the Emmanuel, God with us. That has been the goal of redemptive history right from the beginning, right after the fall. God has been steadily working towards the goal of being reunited with his chosen people for centuries. He has been working out his plan according to his timetable, and now we are farther along than ever before. Rejoice in the Lord and in his salvation through Jesus Christ, whose birth we remember today. Let us thank the Lord each day for our legal status as children of God, who have the full rights as children of God, and who may receive all the abundance of his heavenly inheritance. The Lord appointed Joseph to be the human legal father of Jesus Christ, 
And so we may also be adopted as children of our Heavenly Father and be heirs of his everlasting kingdom. Oh, the wonders of God's grace and compassion. We cannot understand them, but we must believe them and live out of them all the days of our life. He will not leave us alone, but will also give to us his Holy Spirit so that we may grow in faith and obedience to his praise and glory. How we look forward to the day when we may experience in the fullest and deepest way that God is among us, living with us face to face in the new heavens and the new earth. How glorious and wondrous that will be. Amen.